Sorry about that. That's all right. Everybody <laughs> set? All right, uh, good morning. I'm Representative Ken Fredette, the House Republican leader, and today we're here to stand up for the men and women who have been victims of what is commonly referred to as non-consensual pornography. This is a practice of posting nude or explicit photos or videos online without the consent of people being portrayed in the images. There are at least 3,000 websites dedicated to this awful act. In fact, victims often have to pay hundreds or thousands of dollars to have these images taken down from these websites. Make no mistake about it, this is happening everywhere, including right here in Maine. Some of the towns where we have found victims include Bangor, Portland, Dover Foxcroft, Caribou, and Sandton. All over the state, each pin on this map represents cities and towns where we found Mainers who have fallen victims to this disgusting practice. And so on this map here, we've identified, again, all over the state where uh, people are being specifically identified in a specific town um, where they're identified as being a person um, where, there, where there is either a photo or a uh, video of them. And there are other places. We, just, we actually ran out of pins. And so there's far more places than it actually was identified on the map here. All over the state, each, each pin on the map represents the cities and towns in Maine where we found Mainers who have fallen victims of this disgusting practice. This is a despicable act that mostly targets women. In states where there are no laws on the books to punish those responsible, these victims have nowhere to turn. This is currently the practice in Maine. This is not acceptable, nor should it be tolerated. This is not just an issue here in Maine. In fact, it is a national issue where many states have recently acted and where many more legislatures are now taking action. 16 states have currently and most recently uh, passed laws that are currently on the books, and some have made this, in fact, a felony act. And at least 13 more states currently have introduced legislation that would criminalize this in their own states. I am proud to say that now we can add Maine to the list with a bipartisan list of more than 30 sponsors and co-sponsors of this legislation. We, have, we are proposing legislation here in Maine in a bipartisan fashion to make this a Class D crime, punishable up to one year in jail, and up to a $2,000 fine. I am pleased to tell you that on this one issue here in Augusta, that this is not an issue that will get bogged down by partisan politics. I am pleased to see the number of my colleagues from both sides of the aisle, some of whom are standing with me today, who have joined in this fight. By making this a team effort, we can tackle this challenge head on. With that, I would like to introduce Senator Don Hill, the Senate lead Democratic co-sponsor of this piece of legislation. Senator Hill. Good morning. For many of us, it's hard to imagine that we've reached a time when businesses and people can make a living on reputation management. Yet, sadly, it's true. For the many who seek their services, they are merely looking to counteract maybe a bad customer review. But for others, their reputation has been maligned in the most personal and exposing of ways. Revenge porn is a new term for many of us, but it's becoming, unfortunately, increasingly more prevalent. This bill is in response to this new way of life, and it's a first step at protecting both men and women from having their lives ruined. As you can see, protecting people from having their lives ruined is not a partisan issue. And for that, I want to thank Representative Fredette for reaching out and including me as a sponsor. Thank you. Thank you. With that, now I'd like to introduce uh, Representative Diane Russell of Portland, who is the lead House Democratic co-sponsor on this piece of legislation. Good afternoon, or good morning. 
I could not be more honored to be working with such an extreme, uh, an esteemed group uh, to end a, a relatively new phenomenon, as you've heard, uh, the so-called revenge porn that is bringing significant pain, embarrassment, and harm to Maine women and girls in particular. However, let's be honest, it is horrifying that we have to be here today. Who does this? Honestly, who honestly believes that this, is, this kind of behavior is okay? We all know that the photos of ex uh, that explicit photos have long been fodder for crime show blackmail plots. It was the kind of thing placed in a manila envelope and slipped secretly under the door with a note asking for money. With the advent of the internet, however, this type of law and order style plot has grown into a sophisticated and lucrative industry. And instead of photos slipped secretly under the door, the photos are being broadcast worldwide in an instantly searchable database. The same people running the shady websites hosting this explicit content are also running secondary sites that charge victims, as you heard from Representative Fredette, hundreds of dollars to remove the content. In short, they are making victims pay twice, first by running their reputation through the mud, and second by extorting money to make the photos and the videos disappear. Honestly, it never dawned on me that someone would do this. It wasn't until I read an article in the Phoenix, the Portland Phoenix, about two women from Maine who have been victims of this that I realized what it was and started to digest its full potential. Society has rigid, rigid and contradictory expectations of how women and girls should behave. We are either supposed to act like the Virgin Mary and be a symbol of purity and perfection, or we are expected to be an object of sexual fantasy. When graphic images are placed online, the victims are automatically placed in the second category, gory, which has remarkable implications for their interpersonal relationships, job prospects, and educational opportunities. As you know, colleges and HR staff are Googling prospective candidates to get a sense of their moral aptitude. Revenge porn has a direct impact on both of these areas for women in particular. Once the genie is out of the bottle, there is no putting it back in again. This is a mark that permanently stays with women. So much so that victims have committed suicide as a direct result. There is really no good way to describe this set of behaviors. As Representative Fredette said, it's also caused, uh, called non-consensual uh, pornography. And uh, I'm going to skip that because Ken already said that. Look, we live in an era where photos are taken and shared with the world in an instant. I myself have Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter where I share photos. But in cases of abuse, Partners force their victims to take explicit photos or videos and then threaten, promise really, to release those Im images once one of the, that person decides to leave. It is sad that we need to educate women to be careful of what photos or videos get taken of them and with whom, but we do need to educate them so that they understand the potential consequences should those photos or videos get out. But let's be very clear about something. We should not have to educate women about this. Women should be safe to live their lives, to be adults, and to be treated with respect and to have their privacy respected. We are not objects. We are not possessions. We have the right to be intimate with whomever we choose without having to fear that our reputations our educational opportunity, our job prospects can be destroyed overnight by one person with one photo. Look at this map. There are photos of women all across this state. Every pushpin is a victim. That's a lot of pushpins. I can't imagine how, oh, when Rob told me that he was putting this together, I froze. And then I said, you didn't see my name on that list, did you? I can't imagine how I possibly could have ended up on there. But for a moment, my mind raced at just how many ways a bad judgment call could have decimated my life. 
and for how long. If it can happen to Jennifer Lawrence, who had her phone hacked, it can happen to any woman. Representative Fredette sincerely should be commended for introducing this bill and for calling on men everywhere to denounce this kind of behavior as unacceptable in society. I'm delighted to see that we are pushing to make this a Class D crime, punishable by up to one year in jail and $2,000 fine. But frankly, I would be okay with locking these perpetrators up for a decade. Similar bills across the country are already having a deterring effect, and one website operator has already been found guilty. Ironically, that web operator has made no less than 23 requests to Google to have them remove his contact information and any news stories about him owning the site. Apparently, apparently it was okay for the women victims to have their reputations decimated by his website, but he does not seem to believe that he should have to deal with the consequences to his reputation. I commend Google for thus far ignoring those 23 requests. The most important takeaway from today is this. Revenge porn is unacceptable, unconscionable, and an unforgivable act. When we are done this session, it will also be a criminal act. Make no mistake, if you are a victim, we have your back. And if you are a perpetrator, we are coming for you. Thank you, Representative Russell. Um, I now want to, uh, first of all, thank um, Representative Gay Grant for uh, joining us today. She's also a co-sponsor on the bill. Um, and she has a, uh, a personal story that she'd like to share with us. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Fredette. Thank you for putting this together and for putting this bill in and all my co-sponsors for taking this issue seriously. Revenge porn? I never heard of it. I try to stay current. I try to stay up with trends. I try to stay informed about women's issues. I never heard of it. I was coming through the Hall of Flags. I saw the display by the domestic violence folks. I saw the term revenge porn, and immediately I thought of a story told to me by a woman, and I'm going to purposefully obscure some of the details because I don't want to endanger her. This is a true story told to me. This woman, in an abusive marriage, is still in that abusive marriage because her husband unbeknownst to her, videotaped them in their marriage bed on several occasions, as it turns out, and threatened to put those videos on the internet if she leaves him. I was horrified. I couldn't even imagine someone betraying the trust of a loved one in such an intimate setting. And then I was even more horrified to find out that it wasn't against the law, that there wasn't anything this woman could do to level the playing field. I agree with Diane. I think they should be locked away for a lot longer, but this is a good step. In this particular instance, it would certainly deter this individual because it would hurt his job prospects, hurt his reputation, hurt his opportunity to, to uh, have respect in the community. So I say it's about time. And when I found out that Representative Fredette was sponsoring this bill, I sent him a, a message across the chamber, sign me on. Let me do something for this woman. And finding out how, how common it was, horrified me. So I ask folks out there, contact your representatives and let them know that they need to support this bill. We're gonna work it hard, and I don't think anybody's gonna be against this except for the people who are out there profiting on it. So thank you for coming today, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Representative Grant. I, I've been very honored and privileged to come into my third term here in the legislature uh, to work with Julia Kulpitz on a number of issues. Uh, she is the executive director of the Maine Coalition of <coughs> Domestic Violence we worked together on a number of pieces of important legislation, um, including, including amending the bail code, um, electronic monitoring, um, and other pieces of legislation which has 
uh, along with Governor LePage, truly, I think, moved the needle in terms of addressing domestic violence here in Maine. Uh, this was an issue that she first brought to me when we were uh, talking about a uh, funding bill that has uh, been introduced uh, to increase funding for the electronic monitoring program. And so uh, this was an issue that she suggested to me that, uh, that I decided to do. And so again, Julia, thank you for all the work that you not only do on this piece of legislation, but for all of the women here in Maine and the men here in Maine. So thank you. And if you could please come up and give a few comments. I must say, there are some times when deep in my heart, I am so proud of me. The ability to come together in a bipartisan act in all the struggles that may exist elsewhere in order to keep victims safe. The victims in this situation are anywhere from young, young women who are naive and don't understand the limits sometimes of what is safe, who never consented for private acts to be pushed out into a digital universe. Unfortunately, abusers are often ahead of us slightly in their ability to intimidate and coerce using technology, and we're catching up. So in this circumstance, Maine is catching up. And I am so grateful to this collection of legislators, other coalitions that we work with, to step forward to be able to stop this sort of intimidating and dangerous behavior. And I think other people have spoken so eloquently. I don't need to say anything more about those pieces. Um, but thank you again. Thank you, Julia. And uh, we will uh, wrap up with uh, uh, Cara uh, Corchase. 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 You knew I was going to get it wrong. <laughs> I knew it's I was going to get it wrong. And after that, that is, is a friend where I should get that back. <laughs> she is with the Maine Coalition Against Sexual Assault. And uh, Cara, if you want to come up. Good morning. My name is Kara Corshane and I'm the Communications Director at the Maine Coalition Against Sexual Assault. It is difficult to quantify the impacts of non-consensual pornography, commonly known as revenge porn, on individuals and communities. It's a chronically underreported issue. However, we know that victims of non-consensual pornography face significant and specific harm, including harm to relationships with friends, family, and coworkers, and harm for future educational and professional prospects. Sexual assault advocates across the state work with many victims of revenge porn each year. One victim in southern Maine, after her name and several intimate photos of her were posted on several websites by an ex-boyfriend, has moved out of the community where she has lived for her entire life, is in the process of changing her name, has developed severe anxiety and agoraphobia, feels humiliated and ashamed, and has told the advocate she's working with, I will never be in a relationship ever again. Unfortunately for some victims, the impacts do not end there. Due to the public nature of non-consensual pornography, victims receive threats of additional sexual violence, stalking, and sexual harassment, which is especially significant given that a recent study of victims demonstrates that, along with the distributed images, 59% had their full name posted, 26% had their email addresses posted, 16% had their physical address posted, and 14% had their work address posted. People who choose to take photos of themselves often do so with the understanding that the photos will never be shared outside of the context of their consensual relationship. Sometimes those relationships change, and the photos are then distributed or a threat to distribute is made. In other circumstances, the photos are taken under duress or via coercion. Part of the prevention of further crimes is holding offenders accountable. Criminalizing revenge porn will help mitigate its consequences, consequences that we know are serious, long-term, and may result in additional violence. We understand that with all types of sexual activity, consent must be free, willing, and ongoing. The same standard must be applied with regard to the disclosure of private images. The law recognizes that a customer's consent to giving his credit card to a waiter to run a tab is not consent for that waiter to use the information on a personal shopping spree. Permitting someone use of information in one context does not and should not mean consent in other contexts. We are grateful for the bipartisan support on this issue and look forward to working with our product partners through the legislative process.
Thank you. With that, we'll take any questions. Chris, then Steve. I don't know who this question is best for, maybe, maybe Kara. <clears throat> so lots of news is going to come up today about this bill. We're still weeks or months away from passing it. If there's a victim out there who reads the stories today and, and wants to take some steps today, what, what could she do? So, um, the Sexual Assault Support Centers and the Domestic Violence Resource Centers are available uh, to victims to discuss options. Um, the Sexual Assault Crisis and Support Line is available to people. The number is 1-800-871-7741, and you can find more information at mecasa, M-E-C-A-S-A dot org. I can speak to that as well. Um, the main law court has weighed in only in a very narrow way on this. But if there's a victim now who believes that this might happen, they should contact an advocate to help them with a protective order. Because in the civil, in civil situations in Maine, protective orders can stop the release of this information in some circumstances. Particularly if there's a threat to employment or to other conduct that a victim should be entitled to. So in a short way to answer that question, domestic violence advocates um, or sexual assault advocates can walk them through this protective order process in a way that clarifies the impact of this digital threat. So stop it before it has happened if you can. Is that helpful in terms of, so that's an action that they can take. You, you mentioned the, the, the law court decision. Is that um, Clark v. It is. It's Clark v. McLean. Um, and in that particular decision, the law court took a very small segment of this issue, but did say that conduct that a victim is entitled to have, going to work, being comfortable, being safe, or stopping her from conduct that she could have, um, it constitutes a reasonable and protective. I guess the, the other question kind of builds off Chris's initial one, which is, um, I know the bill hasn't been printed, but is this bill directed at the people who the host the images or videos, or is it at the people who supply the, 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 the images? Yeah, and, and just to go to the, the protection order issue, I mean, as an attorney who's practiced law for 20 years, um, you know, we have two means of a protection order. You have a protection from harassment, and you have a protection from abuse. Um, and, and I and what's What's good about that is, is that as soon as somebody files that paperwork with the district court, they can enter into an order that day. And there will be a hearing at a later date to determine uh, whether or not it should become a permanent order. But it is that day that they violate that order. The violation of that order is a Class D crime. And so it is something that's immediate and it's real and it's impactful. Um, in regards to uh, the, the focus of the bill, the focus of the bill will be on the person who is posting the information on the website um, in a non-consensual way. Because that is not illegal right now. That is correct. Is the, is the existence of these websites uh, a free speech issue? I mean, why are we going against after the websites themselves? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, again, it's, it, that's more of a national issue um, in terms of, uh, you know, free speech and whatnot. Um, you know, Maine Civil Liberty, Liberties Union may come out against this bill, and so I mean, I, there are people out there that will say that to some degree this is free speech. I think this is a reasonable limitation on it. But obviously here in Maine, we can't impact if somebody creates a website in Delaware or in Texas or California. What we can do is try to address the conduct of people here in Maine that are doing this to people here in Maine. But to be clear, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, is working on this, and they just brought a pretty sizable um, uh, indict, well, it wasn't an indictment, it was a, conven a conviction. Mm -hmm. um, and so up against a jury, the guy didn't stand a chance. Since we don't have a draft yet, Jim, how do you address the issue that's cropped up in other states of the person having given consent at one point, obviously, to having their picture taken, and the argument is, well, they've given up their consent. And as you know, in some states, that's causing problems. How do you deal with that in well, I think there's a couple of ways. I think, first of all, we recognize that at this point in time, the bill is simply a proposal. It will go to the committee. Um, I, I suspect the committee, um, and I, I expect that this will either go to criminal justice or judiciary, uh, but they'll do a very thorough analysis, I think, of what's going on in other states. Look at maybe what other states' uh, law courts have looked at in terms of maybe constitutional issues so that we narrowly craft this so that it, that it is something that is 
um, reasonable in terms of expectations on both sides. I do think that it's important um, to recognize that, you know, worrying about whether or not it's a perfect piece of legislation in the end is not a reason not to act. And so I think at the end what we want to be able to do is give law enforcement and district attorneys um, and the citizenry an opportunity to understand that their, uh, their legislature has stepped forward to say we think that this is not conduct that's permissible, um, even moral, and we're going to criminalize it. And if, if it wants to be challenged, that will happen in the process down the road. But we think the committee, um, and I think the, even the legislation itself, is fairly narrowly tailored so that we can address those issues. Yeah, go ahead. This is a very narrowly crafted bill, and there is no right now to harass, coerce, intimidate. All we're doing is extending that already existing limitation into digital space and being specific about this behavior fitting into that. Because that's what it is. It is intimidation, coercion, harassment in a way that would not be tolerated um, by laws that don't extend at this point to digital space. So I wouldn't be concerned about this being seen as some giant infringement on free speech. There are already limitations about what you can do to another human being by virtue of your speech. And, and I will make um, the legislation available through uh, Rob Poindexter. So if anybody uh, wants an actual look at the actual bill, uh, Rob, you'll provide that to them today. Absolutely. Any other questions? If not, thank you all for coming. Appreciate it.